So, I think this is the fourth or even the fifth sort of class. And we did get through the first chapter on the right view or right understanding. You can also understand that as right perspective. It's also a nice translation. Um, and it's the view that conditions our motivations, it influences um, our intentions, our attitudes and the way we relate to the world. So if we start off with right view, um, then it's very likely that we'll transform into the right kind of motivations. Yeah? So right view tends to lead to the motivations of renunciation or letting go, nekkama sankapa the motivation of loving kindness, avyapada, sankapa, and the motivation of non-harm, yeah? avihimsaka sankapa, which is like um, Ajahn Brahm's gentleness. So it's a kind of non-violent, gentle attitude to life and to everything we experience in our mind. And so I just wanted to quickly summarize the first chapter because some of you did miss last week and more of you, maybe some of you are here for the first time, but it's nice to kind of go over these things because even for someone who's been studying for a long time, you know, um, the details can slip our minds sometimes. So I think you can never hear these things too much, but I will be quick. And I will also ask for your homework. <laughs> okay, because you did, I did ask you a question. So we'll see if anybody got that. Otherwise, I can tell you what the answer is. All right, so in the first chapter, um, Bhikkhu Bodhi chose some passages that basically gave us a, a general understanding of right view. And the first one was the um, preliminary right view before somebody breaks through as a noble person to the um, profound right view that becomes a path factor. And so that was phrased as there is what is given, what is sacrificed and what is offered. There is a result of our actions, good or bad, yeah? So in other words, a, a, a kind of general understanding of the workings of karma, that the quality of our motivation, our volition will determine the quality of our behavior of body, speech and mind. That there is this and the other world. So that's interesting because even for someone who hasn't seen into rebirth, into past lives and future lives, there's a preliminary understanding that there is more than one world, or at least that we can be open to that possibility and that constitutes part of this preliminary right view and that there is mother and father there are aesthetics brahmins recluses who are enlightened and the point of this is that we also see that there are fields of merit there are ways to actually develop very good karma yeah because any kind of gift that's offered to mother and father or to virtuous recluses including bhikkhunis especially forest dwelling bhikkhunis um, it does issue in very um, good karmic results, you know, it will issue in your own happiness now and in the future. And so, and of course, with our parents, we have this debt of gratitude, even though some of us may have had, you know, very difficult upbringings. I mean, in some cases, of course, you know, we actually have to separate from family members if it's been a very difficult upbringing. But all the same, we have our life, we have this human life. And because of that, we have an opportunity to do good and to better our karma and hopefully um, take some steps on this path. And then at the um, deeper level, when the right view becomes um, noble right view, it is co-joined with wisdom, the faculty of wisdom in one who is noble and one who is now walking the path as a noble person. So in other words, the understanding of the right view is at a much deeper level. And because of that, it will inform all the other successive path factors to be taken at a deeper level. So it's as though the path is in one sense linear, that the right view will feed into right motivation, which will feed into ethics, etc. But on the other hand, the whole thing is also circular. So you can walk through the whole thing from start to finish once. And then the deeper the samadhi, the deeper the right view is. And you can walk around it again and again. And each time your understanding just goes that bit deeper. So it's a very beautiful path. Like a cake, you know, that you can slice into eight. And wherever you take that slice from, it's going to taste beautiful. It's going to taste sweet. 
<laughs> of course, with a cake, you can't eat the whole thing. You get kind of sick. But with the noble path, you get a sweeter and sweeter sense of freedom and renunciation. So it's going in the opposite way from sensuality. And then the next um, definition of right view was basically differentiating the wholesome from the unwholesome um, in terms of behavior. So that was looking at precepts and the lack of precepts, if you like, virtue and the lack of virtue. And also the roots behind those two. So the roots of the wholesome will be um, non-greed, non-hatred and non-delusion. And the roots of the unwholesome will be greed, hate and delusion. So we're starting to look at where these things come from. And then he talked about karma, the origin of karma, the diversity, the result and the cessation of karma. So this is just going through quickly. Anyone, if you do want to revisit it, you can look at it later. And then he talked about karma in the sense of how beings fare according to their actions, according to their volition. Um, and this was one of the Buddha's insights, what he called one of the cracks in the egg when he um, awakened and became fully enlightened. And he developed the divine eye, which is I think in English called clairvoyance. And he was actually able to see beings passing away and being reborn according to their karma in various different kind of um, states and existences. So that was one, there was only actually one written down last week. I was getting confused because it looked like they'd kind of amalgamated it, but it was actually just that one, the divine eye. And the first thing that he broke through to was his recollection of past lives in quite a lot of detail. And my homework question for you was, what was the third crack in the egg? So I wonder if anybody did look that up and would like to share what they found. Did anyone look? If you did, you can raise your hand if you wish and let us know. <laughs> oh, great. Somebody did raise their hand. Who's doing the Q&A today? I do. One moment. Kat, can you unmute? He had um, insight into suffering and the end of suffering. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's right. He had insight into suffering and as a result, he was actually freed from what we call the asoas, which are variously translated as the outflowings or the influxes um, of the mind. So yeah, basically um, uprooting those root defilements from their source. And I did um, make a little screenshot of that passage. So for those who, wish I can give you a bit more detail. Mm. Yeah. So this was the third knowledge. And interestingly, all of these came about after deep meditation, after experiencing like the, the jhana states where the hindrances are fully abolished for that period of time. So I'm going to change the translation a little bit from the word concentration to stillness. So he says, when my mind was thus stilled, purified, cleansed, unblemished, whoops, where's it gone? Rid of defilement, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge and destruction of the taints. That's the asawas. I understood as it really is, this is suffering. I understood as it really is, this is the origin of suffering. I understood as it really is, this is the cessation of suffering. And I understood as it really is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I understood as it really is, these are the asawas or the taints. I understood as it really is, this is the origin of the taints. This is the cessation of the taints. And this is the way leading to the cessation of the taints the same Eightfold Noble Path. So yeah, great, Kath. I'm glad that somebody looked into that. That's really wonderful. So I wanted to just read a little bit from Bhikkhu Bodhi's introduction to this chapter because I thought it was very beautiful the way he makes a link to, um, to our views 
and our motivations. So he gives these lovely similes, which are actually from the suttas. After saying that, you know, our views are basically conditioning our motivations in, in life. So he said that, uh, yeah, he's comparing wrong view here to a seed, to a bitter seed. And he says, just as the seed of neem or a bitter cucumber or bitter gourd planted in moist soil and receiving water, would all lead to fruits with a bitter flavor. So for a person with wrong view, whatever bodily action, verbal action and mental action they undertake in accordance with that view, whatever their volition, yearning, inclination and activities, they will lead to harm and suffering. For what reason? Because the view is bad or wrong. Right view in contrast is like the seed of a sweet plant just as the seed of a sugar cane, hill rice or grape planted in moist soil and receiving water would all lead to fruits with a sweet and delectable flavor. Just so for a person of right view, whatever bodily action, verbal action and mental action they undertake in accordance with that view and whatever their volition, their yearning, inclination and volitional activities all lead to the well-being and happiness. For what reason? Because the view is good. So basically having this right view makes it much more likely, gives us a proper motivation, especially the insight into suffering and how we all suffer, right? And as a result of that, we want to abstain from doing things that harm us. We want to abstain from um, doing those same things to others. Um, because of that, we have this beautiful motivation to, to come from a place of compassion place of benevolence and and um yeah you could say the opposite of uh, greed or sensuality is also like um renunciation but also giving also being kind being generous yeah and it's interesting that um the first part of the next chapter that we're going to look at starts with generosity and uh generosity can be seen as uh part of that renunciation. So, you know, in this way, the right view leads straight into right motivation. And the first of those three right motivations is nikkama sankapa, giving or renouncing or letting go. So that is very much associated with generosity. And the word that um, is used in most of these sort of, the word that's translated as generosity is actually chaga. I don't know if anybody else knows where that word chaga is seen in the Eightfold Path, but it's actually part of um, the third noble truth. Yeah. It's part of letting go. It's a type of letting go. Yeah. And so it's very beautiful, I find, that when we open this chapter on personal training, people might think, right, now it's all about me. I've got to kind of control my mind. I've got to train myself to be better or to you know, be wiser or whatever. But the very first thing you'll see in the training is generosity. It's actually about others. Yeah. So the first way we train ourselves is to think about others, to expand our understanding <coughs> of life, to include others, to come out of selfishness. Yeah. To start thinking about ways to um, promote harmony, to promote goodness, to bring happiness to people's hearts. And also, of course, generosity can actually alleviate people's suffering, right? Especially those who are going through hardships or who are very alone or who, you know, maybe don't have enough to eat. You know, in the case of, say, situations that are happening across the world now, there's a lot of starvation in places like Yemen. And then there's the situation in Myanmar where many people have joined the, um, the what do you call it, um, thingy democracy movement, oh, civil disobedient movement. And because of that, they don't have their jobs. And so this generosity can actually help save lives of people we don't even know. And it gives us such a joy, right, to be able to participate in that, even when it's people we've never met, we are never going to meet, they're never going to thank us. But the training of our own heart starts by including others as though they are ourselves. So you can see that all of that as an expression of the third noble truth, yeah. And in another place, Bhikkhu Bodhi explains it as like generosity as being like the whole thrust of the path, 
like the whole movement, the whole direction is one of giving, giving away, giving up. Yeah. And this, of course, helps us overcome craving, clinging, stinginess, miserliness. And that kind of narrow, selfish, contracted heart. Yeah. So it's starting to open up our hearts. So with that introduction, I will start to read some suttas. And these are just little excerpts that are, that are put together in this chapter. And as usual, we'll have some discussion around it. Um, I'll probably read through the first couple because they're really short and then we'll see if anybody wants to add anything. And please feel free to, you know, bring up anything that's pertinent to you in your lives. Anything that you're working with, struggling with, um, different ways perhaps of being generous that come to mind, okay? <clears throat> so this is page 31 in the magic book. So this is directed to the monastics. So I will use the word monastics here. And it's called Miserliness and Guttava 5254. Great. Thanks, Gunta. He's put the link in there. There are monastics, these five kinds of miserliness or stinginess. What five? Miserliness with regard to dwellings. Miserliness with regard to families. Miserliness with regard to gains. Miserliness with regard to praise. And miserliness with regards to the Dhamma. There are these five kinds of miserliness. Of these five kinds of miserliness, the vilest is miserliness with regard to the Dhamma. The spiritual life is lived for the abandoning and eradication of these five kinds of miserliness. So that's quite a bold statement already to say that we're living this spiritual life to abolish miserliness. And of course, that's one way you can look at it, but I think a very important way precisely because it does. Um, it's, it's a basic requirement to start coming out of um, a selfish perspective on life, thinking only of one's own gain, you know, and, and in this case, miserliness is probably also motivated actually by a kind of meanness, right? A kind of, I mean, obviously delusions involved, but also a kind of aversion, you know, like I, I want to do well, but I don't want this other person to do well. And that can be especially the case when we maybe have conflict with another person. It's very hard to see someone we don't like or someone who we think is immoral it's very hard to see them doing well, isn't it, sometimes? <laughs> so another antidote, actually, to the miserliness is mudita, to be able to rejoice with other people rather than feel sort of jealous or, or mean about it. <clears throat> so I think these five things, of course, it's not an exhaustive list, and um, you could add many more things here, but um, it includes material as well as mental possessions, if you like, you know, it includes uh, dwellings. So my friend over there in, in the beautiful forest has now um, <laughs> had a kuti. You've just been developing a kuti over there in the forest. And straight away, she said to me, you'll have to come over, you know, you'll have to come and share. So that's the opposite, isn't it, of miserliness. She could have said, oh, I want that kuti. You know, I hope I get that kuti. No one else can come and stay there. And, you know, there's this balcony on the kuti and maybe other people want to come and do yoga there, but I don't want them to. <laughs> but no, she said the opposite. You know, she said, oh, people can come and enjoy that space and, you know, do their yoga in the forest. So it was very beautiful. So that's generosity in regard to dwellings. Miserliness in regard to families, gains, any kind of material possessions there. With regard to praise, that's quite interesting because sometimes we probably don't boost each other up enough, I think. I think, I don't know about in all cultures, but in England, we're a little bit sparse with our praise. <laughs> we don't want to be accused of being too effusive or, um, you know, uh, insincere. So sometimes we're like, yeah, it's okay. Yes, it's not bad. You did it okay, but yeah. Perhaps we could be a little bit less miserly with regard to praise and miserliness with regard to the Dhamma. So 
sharing the Dhamma, teaching the Dhamma, giving access to people to uh, come and receive and share in the Dhamma. This is all part of beautiful generosity. And here he's saying that the worst kind of miserliness is uh, with regard to the Dhamma. So that's quite interesting. I mean, it just popped into my mind now that um, I do struggle sometimes with the ethical kind of issue around charging a lot of money for Dhamma, for example, which happens, right? It happens as things become commercialized, as the mindfulness movement takes off and they kind of um, commodify certain aspects of the path and then price it up in these lovely packages, which, you know, I mean, okay, they've done a certain training for that, but is that really helping people access the teachings or is it actually an obstacle to some people? I'd like to think it does more good than harm, but I think it's something that we have to consider, you know, how accessible is this Dhamma and what are the ways that we can increase our generosity with regards to sharing that Dhamma? So for me, I guess, there's a kind of embodied sense of when I'm being miserly, I can feel it. I, I can feel a kind of contraction, you know, a kind of like sense of lack or something and wanting to keep things for myself. And the opposite of that, when you're thinking about how you can help others, give to others, it's like, oh, the heart feels so free and so wide. And it actually seems to, rather than feeling that you're losing something, it actually seems to engender a, a, a sort of perception of abundance you know that you have enough to give you have enough to share I don't know how other people find that yeah I said I'd get through two chapters two <laughs> before opening but does anyone want to comment on that or what, what miserliness means to you or shall I keep reading has John got his hand up if you can use the little, um, where possible, when you can use the raise hand button, it's easier for our co-host to identify you. But I think John did have his hand up. John Walter, John W. Yeah, can you I, I, I can relate, yes, good evening. Um, good evening. I mean, today I, today I, I I've been inspired by uh, by uh, the mudita and that that sharing, and I took my time to transcribe a, your meditation the other day, and I'm sharing it already with my family. So it's like straight away. It's, oh. it's I've, I've never done that before, but it's uh, they had a small request, and and I think it's it's that beautiful feeling of you know giving, just giving that. And, and the sharing that. So yeah, straight away, it's all linked together. Thank you. Mm. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so hopefully I will be sharing that Mudita as a family meditation, um, oh. you know, we're, we're, we're spread around the world. So it's, it's, it's a really, it'll be hopefully beneficial for everybody. Gorgeous. It makes oh. me feel <laughs> makes Yes, me feel exactly. Good. It makes you feel good. And I love yeah. the way that you brought up the fact that it's so connecting you know it's connected it is. Yeah. yeah thank you thanks john um i'm asking james Taki now hello hi james hi just a quick question really is when it says vilest is the miserliness with regard to the dharma is that like almost a call to be evangelical about it <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question yeah that's um, the way I it. right okay mm, not necessarily because it's not actually saying what you should do or that, you know it's not actually saying how to promote the dharma it's just saying that it's really wrong to i would say keep a closed fist and not to share but i think the person has to be um willing to receive in order for that gift to be effective and actually in Buddhism, we don't promote evangelizing, is that the right word? Prophelicizing. Um, because someone has to be ready to hear the Dhamma. Oh. It, it simply won't have the same effect if we go around sort of telling people, this is how 
um, you know, you should practice, this is what you should do. And I think many meditators, at least in my experience, and for me also, when we first um, come to the practice, we're so enthusiastic, we just want to tell everyone, go and do a retreat, you know, it'll change your life, you must do a retreat, if you don't do a retreat, you know, you've got a human life, you're wasting your life. <laughs> And it just never works that way, you know, because the way that people really get a taste and get access to the Dhamma is through your behavior, through your way of embodying that Dhamma in your life. And I would say that that is the most powerful way to share the Dhamma, to actually live the Dhamma, you know, to develop kindness, compassion, non-judgment, rather than say my family, you know, they just watch the TV all the time to actually say, okay, you know, like, how can I just connect a little bit more with them and understand where they're coming from? And then they start to think, aha, something's changed in my daughter, for example. And then bit by bit in their own time, they start to approach it. So the miserliness would be to actually keep them out, I would say, to like sort of say, this is my path, you know, you're not coming on it. Or yeah, if you haven't got a uh, if you have got something to share, you, you perhaps charge for it, or you know, maybe you only want to teach to select few people. For me, it's more pointing towards the fact that the Dhamma is for all, and we shouldn't discriminate, we shouldn't, you know, um, yeah, make it difficult for anyone to access that. Yeah. That's kind of how I understand it, yeah. Thanks for the question. Okay, I have, a lot of questions coming. <laughs> I ask now Max, Max Bell to unmute. Okay. Yeah, hi, hi Kanda. Um, I tell you what, where I find a difficulty, um, generosity to others, wonderful. Generosity to oneself, I find it's hard still to remain humble. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. If you're over generous to yourself, and mm -hmm. I find that quite difficult sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Just <laughs> you, you know, when yeah. you're being generous to yourself, or you're being selfish sometimes. Right. Rather, right. Rather than selfless, you know. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, yeah. My difficulty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The words of my first teacher come to mind actually in regard to that. And it always really struck me because he used to say, be selfish, knowing where your true interest lies, knowing where your true self-interest lies. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was like, be selfish, knowing that your true self-interest actually lies in thinking of others as well Getting given. not to the exclusion of yourself mm. but to include others as well mm -hmm. and that was always in the context of meditating and then giving service and the way that that organization ran was that meditators would come and receive the teachings for free on a donation basis so you already felt that like you were receiving a gift right of generosity of the generosity of others many others thousands of others unknown people and then you had the opportunity to give back by serving. He always used to say, you know, you can make a material donation, but a donation of service is much, much greater because you're creating the volition to help others every moment for whole 10 days when you're serving or 30 days or 45 days. Yeah. So many moments throughout the day, if not the whole day, you're just thinking about, are they okay? What can I do yeah. to help? You know, yeah. keeping the peaceful atmosphere, making sure everyone gets their food on time or, you know, mm. Mm. giving them moral support. Uh, and, and I always found that very beautiful. And at some point, I think with this giving, you start to realize there is no real division between one's own and others' welfare and well-being. Uh, yeah. So I would probably say like, yeah, I mean, it can slip into selfishness when our heart starts to close down and we forget about others. But if we're taking care of ourselves in a wholesome way so that we can then go back into the world and, and actually help others, then, yeah. then there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually part of the generosity. Mm. It's part yeah. of the practice. Um, so, yeah, there's a few reflections there. Yeah, thank you. So um, we, yeah, I was just going to say we we're generous to ourselves, 
within the whole context yes. of being generous to everyone. Exactly. And we include ourselves in that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because if we develop those motivations of loving kindness and compassion towards ourselves, I mean, I don't think the mind really notices the difference between whether it's to yourself or anyone else. You're, mm. you're sending your mind along a very beautiful pathway and that yeah. motivation is going to be increased and it's just going to start spilling over into everyone yeah. you meet, especially yeah. if it starts with right view. Mm. Yeah. Especially the sutta we read last week, the last one in that chapter, which was about, okay, as uh, when I suffer, you know, I suffer when people are mean to me, for example. So mm. if I'm mean to others, if I'm cruel to others, or if I say hard speech to others, they will suffer. So for yeah. that reason, out of compassion, out of wisdom, understanding how we are basically the same, um, yeah. there lies the motivation to develop mm. compassion. In fact, it becomes very easy, doesn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, two more, and then we'll try and move on to the second paragraph. <laughs> Janaki, if you could unmute, please. Sorry. Uh. You're fine, um, oh, we're just... Um, you're yeah, again. it's about the myselfness. Um, I think myselfness is actually that you are selfish because the core of Buddhism or the Buddha's teaching is that to become selfless or letting to let go or letting go so if that means that you are not attached to your desires or personal gains or to a self so the only way of getting rid of my selfness is that you have to become selfless and then you no longer feel selfish about mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. that, that's that's my understanding yeah yeah i mean i think that's true to a degree um but being looking after yourself is not selfish because it's only when you feel resourced when you have you know basically enough food to eat <laughs> a reasonably suitable place to stay you know um good friends around you like the right kind of um teaching the right kind of livelihood it's only then that you can actually feel resourced enough to be able to share with others right but i think there's a real difference between desire and greed and actually just understanding what is enough and unfortunately in modern society <laughs> A lot of the time we're following greed, not need, right? We're following our greed, our desires. And that's, um, there's a subtle line there that we might not always realize we've crossed. <laughs> but that's why simplicity and contentment with little is also part of the gradual training. It's right there in the beginning as an aspect of virtue. So as part of developing virtue, we also develop contentment and, and, um, and, uh, a kind of taste for simplicity because we start to feel that it's much more freeing when we don't need very much. And the path is so beautiful because through developing virtue, we start to develop a kind of inner happiness. And when that happiness starts to arise within ourselves, we actually don't look to the, you know, our possessions, our external situations with as much kind of need or as much clinging because we know that we're we can manage with little, we know. I mean, like if you do live in a forest and you just have a little cootie and you have to sort of, you know, walk to the main room just to sort of put the kettle on or whatever, there's a certain freedom in that. You feel like, oh, I'm just managing, I'm in touch with nature, I'm not taking more resources, you know, than are due to me. And it's a way of living in harmony that treads lightly on the world, you know. It's not um, contributing to the global climate crisis. And you start to develop a sense of joy for that. So I think, yeah, we need to have enough to feel at ease, but not so much that it becomes, it leads to stinginess. It's interesting how, you know, sometimes people think if I have more, then I can be more generous. But actually, to me, it looks as though when people start to get an excess of material stuff they also become a lot more covetous and want to keep it and want to have kind of guards on the you know front of the house and guard dogs and <laughs> because they become so dependent on it 
and they actually don't know how they manage without it. It's like they need ever increasing amounts of comfort and excess just to live a, a basically happy life because the happiness isn't coming from within. Yeah. Yes, it's kind of bliss actually. The happiness is, is actually a bliss that what you derive not by satisfying the sensual pleasures. Hmm. Right, exactly. We're looking in a different direction. We start to look inside. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you very much. One more? Yeah, Shirley, can you unmute, please? Sorry, I was just trying to find the unmute button. Um, yeah, I was just thinking when you, we were talking about the miserlessness connected with Dhamma, I, I immediately thought of just sort of holding on to the teaching and not wanting to share it with others. But I wondered if it could also mean um, sort of being selfish in one's practice, like not wanting to have one's meditation disturbed uh -huh. and, you know, getting irritated if people, my, my meditation, my space. And of course, we've got to make a quiet space for ourselves. And of course, that isn't selfish. Yeah. But we can just, so, so I think it's very beautiful when we do share the merits of our meditation and our mm -hmm. practice at, at the end and just sort of reflect that I'm actually doing this for my well-being and, and the well-being of others. It connects very much with your little conversation with Maxwell that actually there's no, there's no division. But it's, it's, it's quite easy to sort of drop into this sort of selfishness. Yeah. Oh, I've got to get my meditation right. This is my time for my practice. And, you know, then we've, then we've, we've blown it, really. So I wondered <laughs> if miserless, according to the Dhamma, can mean that as well because that is very that is a very vile form of miserliness isn't it that's really a good point right i mean i think these suttas can mean whatever the meaning you want to give them yeah. and i mean it's really interesting that you point that out and it is a pitfall for meditators in um, long retreat or you know maybe sometimes for monastics and um i lived in burma for many years about four years practicing there from first years of my monastic life. And there was someone else there who was um, getting really into her meditation as we all were, um, but she would frequently decide to be in serious silence as opposed to ordinary silence. And what I realized it meant was like, don't come near me, don't talk to me no matter what. <laughs> and so it started to feel like, serious silence quite intimidating quite yeah. intimidating um and there was one time i was very sick right next door to this person i mean it was very loud because i had this terrible burping and just it was very very bad actually and um they didn't they didn't you know come and see how i was or whatever so yeah it felt like something was not balanced there mm -hmm. um but it's one reason that i think monastic life can be great if you're actually in a community of people who are training according to the suttas and who are like it says in the suttas living like milk and water mixed <laughs> thinking mm. about each other making sure everybody's at ease and then they go to the forest and and you know settle into their meditation so first you have this beautiful foundation of harmony of goodwill of friendship of affection, you know, mm. you reflect on how fortunate you are to have spiritual friends. And then with that in your heart and knowing that you cared for each other, then you can go and practice. And yes, the practice is very different. And I think it's beautiful what you say about, you know, make it a practice at the end of every meditation to share the merits of your practice, to share any peace, any harmony, any wisdom that's arisen for you, to share that with all beings, you know. Whether you believe it reaches them or not, it's not the point. It's a, it's a heart expanding practice. It's a movement of the mind that includes others. So it's very beautiful. It's a nice, a nice thought. Yeah, thanks. It's always interesting to hear how these teachings can be applied and just draw out those other nuances that can be there. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we'll get on to the second 
paragraph now. <laughs> so the first one talked about miserliness, and this talks about accomplishment in generosity. <clears throat> and this is from Anguttara 461. And what is accomplishment in generosity? And here the word is chaga, as I mentioned. Here, a noble disciple dwells at home with a mind free from the stain of miserliness, freely generous. That's mutto chaga or something, or mut mutto chaga, which is like two words of, from the uh, third noble truth, mutti and chaga, so freely generous open-handed, delighting in relinquishment, devoted to charity, delighting in giving and sharing. This is called accomplishment in generosity. Isn't that lovely? I find that so lovely because there's such an emphasis there on the freedom and the delight that we can experience through giving, through being generous. Yeah. And if you're having that delight right at the beginning of the path, it's going to carry through, isn't it? It's going to carry through the whole path because the whole movement is one of giving, giving away. So there's this beautiful delight. And the Buddha in another part, I don't know where this is actually, but he suggests that when giving, we should reflect on the deed before we do it reflect while we do it and reflect afterwards. And the whole point of that is to increase the joy. So you're thinking, oh, you know, like I'm doing it now. <laughs> Someone's coming to visit me and I've got all these fruit and vegetables that I can't eat and I'm, I want to give to them. So I'm putting it all in bags and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna give this to them. And she'll probably want to use it for this, use it for that. And, you know, I look at the bag and I think, yeah, that's a really nice gift. And <laughs> So I'm getting this joy because as a non, you don't have very much to give materially. So I get this joy. And then, you know, when I give it, I can, give it feeling joyful, noticing that freeing effect on the heart, open-handed, delighting in relinquishment. And then also the Buddha said that we have this practice called Chaganu Sati, which means reflection on our generosity. Chaga, the same word. So we can actually bring up the beautiful deeds that we may have done in our day, in our life, even small little things, bring them up in our mind and reflect on how it felt to do that. You know, what was the quality of the heart? What was the quality of our motivation at that time? How did it feel? Which is really beautiful. So we actually learn to tap into a different source of joy, a joy that's based on giving up rather than gaining. So I find this very beautiful. And I was thinking earlier that, um, Sometimes in our Western society, we think that getting stuff is more joyful than giving stuff because when you give, you lose something, but when you get, you get something, right? <laughs> in a materialistic society, we can think that way. But after a while, when you get used to giving, you find it's far more joyful than receiving, actually. It's even more joyful. And that by receiving, you're actually giving, right? paradoxically. But that's, in a sense, one of the things we do as alms mendicants, as monastics who live on the alms, live on the generosity of others. We're giving them an opportunity to practice giving, right? And it's very beautiful to receive, but I've noticed that my greatest joy when I'm offered food is in knowing that somebody else had that beautiful motivation you know, it's not even about what I get. It's, it's knowing that there are such kind people in this world, you know, and that people are getting a taste of what it's like to give. And I feel that that's a real gift. Like being able to receive is actually a gift for others. Hmm. I don't know if anybody else has experienced trying to sort of say something kind to another person or give something to another person. That person doesn't want to receive it. And then it's like, how does that feel? for you as the giver. It's like there's a block. It's like you can't perform that goodness that you want to express. You can't express that love, that, you know, that wish to care. 
So it, it's really lovely when we when we understand that. And I think over time, this whole thing of giver and receiver starts to fade. Like the the, bar the the boundary starts to dissolve, and you both become, you know, kind of together in that in that uh, in that beautiful what can you call it a dance or that beautiful kind of uh, ceremony? I don't know. The energy you're both sharing that energy, and uh, yeah, it reminded me of something that from the Visuddhimagga actually where it says, um, the, the, the deed is, but no doer of the deed is there. <laughs> so it becomes a kind of, yeah, a truly selfless thing in the, in the sense that it can start to dissolve the boundaries between self and other. Um, and you just do it because it's a beautiful thing to do. It doesn't really matter who's receiving, who's giving, you're, you're both involved in this beautiful act. Yeah, I noticed in Verma actually that people really understand that. Because most of the time I was on the receiving end, but one time my parents came to visit me and uh, I told them that there's a village, you know, nearby, it was two miles walk. And it was very poor, you know, I don't know, some of you might have seen photos of Burma on the news recently. People live in kind of, ta what do you call it? Tatami huts. Like it's just a very, very thin kind of woven wall. You wouldn't even call it a wall. I mean, the wind can go through it. And because of that, when we had the big cyclone, they all stayed up because the wind could go straight through, right? So actually they were safer in some ways than the brick buildings. And, uh, and they live in these little huts. So when my parents came, we walked to that village and I went to uh, one family who used to frequently invite me and my friend, another nun. And my parents had bought this box of chocolates, quite fancy. Definitely not the kind of thing that these villagers would ever have seen in their life, right? So in my mind, I kind of thought, what will they think? Will they receive it? Will they be embarrassed or will they be overwhelmed? or? but it was so beautiful to watch them receive it because they, they just, with such grace, they just put their hand out, took it. Very calm, without excitement, without rejection. And they just put it next to the Buddha, like as an offering, left it there for a while. I'm sure they ate it, but it was just so beautiful to see how readily they could receive without any fuss, you know? as though this kind of act of giving and receiving was all the same. It, it was very touching. It's hard to kind of express, but there was just such a dignity and a grace in how these very poor people, I don't know, just had that sense of real self-respect. And uh, yeah, it was very beautiful. Wow, it makes me quite, quite emotional because there's just such a lot of, Dhamma in that country, you know, in the hearts of the people. Yeah. So, yeah. And I do think it includes being generous to ourselves, you know. It can also include like being generous with our time, being generous in the way we think about others, the way we regard others. Yeah. Do we regard them with kindly eyes or? Do we just see all their faults and all their kind of strange idiosyncrasies and like <laughs> try and fix them up? And, oh, you're not a really good nun, you know, you should have shaved your hair a bit earlier. <laughs> you know, you get you always rock up a bit late. <laughs> or do we just, yeah, give people the benefit of the doubt? And, and yeah, like it said in the first one, praise also, you know, don't only think good thoughts, but actually verbalize them encourage each other, boost each other up. This is an important part of generosity too. So you don't have to have a lot, is my point, materially. We can still give a lot. We can still give a lot of care, you know, a lot of attention, kindness, listening, space, space for people to grow, space for people to make mistakes. This is my teacher. He is infinitely patient. And he gives me all the space. 
<laughs> that I need to grow from <laughs> being a little bit of a pain in the bum. I said to him one time, am I a pain in the bum? You know, because I'm quite cheeky sometimes, but in a, in a sweet way. I mean, there's a very deep respect. And he said, no, if you change, if, you, if you're not cheeky anymore, I won't talk to you, he said. <laughs> So it sounds kind of silly. It sounds maybe even like a bit of a jokey conversation, but there's something very deep in that because he's saying, you know, you're so accepted the way you are. I don't even want you to change, right? I want you to feel that free to just be yourself because I relate to you as in, in an authentic way. It's authentic, right? We're actually connecting at a human level. And there's something very beautiful about that. I'm very deeply touched whenever I think about it, you know whenever I think about my relationship with my teacher and my spiritual companions, you know, my friend who's sitting here on her phone in the forest, we've spent also a very beautiful rains retreat together. And I think we were very, we really looked after each other, huh? Sometimes we got a bit giggly. <laughs> we were meditating a lot, but sometimes we were like, just got to tell you, just got to tell you. <laughs> it was really lovely. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting a bit giddy on this. I thought it'd be quite uplifting, but yeah, you've got to stop me talking. Please interrupt. We'll take a couple of more questions. I'm asking uh, Connie if you could unmute, please. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, it was it was actually just more of a comment uh, when you when you spoke about Burma. Recently, I saw that the monastics in Myanmar had given food to the people um, of Myanmar. Obviously, they didn't have, they don't have anything at the moment. A lot of them were really hungry, and the the monastics had food left over, yeah. so they then gave it back to the people. And I, when I saw that at the time, I, 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 oh, it was just beautiful. I mean, quite sad that that has to happen, but, you know, the thought of them having been given this food and then returning it mm -hmm. was, just, I think, was generosity to a tea. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that, because I also read about that, and it is very beautiful. It shows such great wisdom and such a just pure spontaneous wisdom right, that goes beyond these designations that you're the lay person, I'm the monastic. It's just, you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very beautiful. And the lovely thing is it probably doesn't actually come back to the exact same people that gave it. So it's probably more like a, a chain where it's just kind of being, you know, kind of circulating to the right places. And, and it's very, very inspiring to see yeah. this yeah um, it's quite inspiring is is actually a good word to use for it it does actually make you want to do something yeah. similar you know yes we have quite a lot in this country compared to a lot of other people um, and we possibly don't give enough so. yes yes that's true that's true apparently you know the best countries like the ones that are best at dana in the world are burma surprise surprise because it's in their blood and america interestingly I, i've read that yeah that worldwide the nations that give the most dana are um you know the most charity the, i guess it means like it must be quantifiable so it must be you know how much comes into charities and that sort of thing but yeah burma and america interestingly Perhaps I was thinking it could be America because things are so privatized and you know there's such a big disparity between rich and poor that it actually encourages or almost not enforces but in a way you have to start looking after each other right yeah no, and I yeah. think that's what we're seeing in Myanmar too like when things are so dire you can either start looting and <laughs> you know attacking each other or you can pull together and it's just amazingly inspiring to see the way that they go yeah it is yeah thank you to, yeah. To yes exactly that point about copying yeah as well because last week in the right understanding the last um sutta we read which was talking about um you know understanding that just as others suffer we suffer too so just as they they don't like 
to be hurt. We don't like to be hurt. Sorry, just as we don't like to be hurt, no one likes to be hurt. But then it was saying, the outcome of that is that we abstain and we encourage others to abstain. And we speak in praise of encouraging others to abstain. So, or in praise of abstaining. So it's really important to inspire each other, to encourage each other. And um, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> uh, I ask Diana now to unmute. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Diana. Hi, Venerable Tanda. Um, I have two things. First, could you please remind me the Pali word for miserliness? Ah, I think it's macharya, something like that. Let me see if I can find the spelling. I think it's M-A-C-C-A-R-A. -A. Is that something like that, Derek? Macharya? Derek might know. Or maybe I uh, Chitananda might know. Uh, I do have it, actually, because I have a few Pali words here. I think it's macharya pretty much, or, or some derivation of that. I mean, I'm not sure what um, case that's in. Let me just check. Yeah, in this sutta it says macharena, and I think that means uh, that's one of the cases, yeah? So I think it's M-A-C-C-H, and then probably A-R, Eric put it in the chat with an E. Is it Machera? Okay. Mm. Okay. It was Macharia. But yeah, one of those things. Yeah, you're probably right, Derek. Yeah, super. Sometimes it's translated as stinginess, which I quite like Stingy. as well. Because people can be kind of, they can give a bit but they can be kind of stingy about how much they give. <laughs> it's like, you can think, oh, I'll give something, but I'll give the like bare minimum, you know? <laughs> or you well, can think, oh, I'll give so that it pinches a little bit so that I feel that I've given, that I've actually had to let go of something. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, I like this uh, in the accomplishment in generosity section that you read delighting in relinquishment mm. and it reminds me of a couple of weeks ago I put some things out by the side of the road for free because we do that in our neighborhood we'll put things out and then people will take them mm. and after they were taken I realized one of those things maybe I wished I didn't put it out there and started having these feelings of clinging to it and mm. um, it's something I've been working with for the past week like because when the clinging comes up it's a good time to work with clinging but I think it's also miserliness like I think they're related and the idea of rejoicing and giving mm -hmm. even if it is something that maybe meant something more than I realized like it's a good yeah. thing to let it go yeah yeah it's an interesting one isn't it because we don't want to push away the feeling of ouch if you do kind of have a little slight regret like I think honoring that is okay like oh I did do you know I do miss that thing like not feel bad about that or guilty about that but to also feel that and have a little bit of compassion for yourself but then perhaps at another time you could rather than dwell on how you feel now you could actually try and remember how you felt at the time when you gave those things yeah. Because I'm sure that when you actually did it, you felt quite good about it. And before you did it, you probably felt quite good about it. So I'm just wondering if connecting with that might help to encourage your mind that actually there was a lot of joy in that as well. Yeah, that's a good point because when I thought of putting it out on the side of the road, there was no attachment. It was completely, right. and that came up after, so. Yeah, yeah. And then it gives the mind like, it's like saying, look, mind, this is how it feels when you let go. I mean, don't deny that you feel a bit sad now. You can be compassionate with that, right? We can just apply these beautiful motivations to whatever arises. But, you know, remember, this is actually how it felt. 
and then gradually the mind gets more courage and starts to yeah but also i mean we shouldn't be necessarily giving away things that matter to us if it's going to cause us suffering i mean that's not necessarily required i think um we can learn from that and then next time yeah maybe be a little less rash <laughs> yeah <laughs> lot to learn there yeah <laughs> we can't get it always right i mean yeah. a lot of our spiritual paths we just want to avoid suffering and there's nothing wrong with having a bit of suffering we learn don't we <laughs> good okay it's 20 past and we've only <laughs> oh i actually thought we might get through the entire generosity but we've only done actually, <laughs> we've done that this much but that's okay because these are discussions so it's very nice to to you know pull it all out and make it apply but i'm wondering if um if we should just talk a bit more because we've only got 10 minutes or uh or shall i start the next one what what do you think guys people girls There's a lot of um, nods, but unfortunately I can't hear you. <laughs> Shall I read a bit more? We've got five minutes. I could read like a couple. Yeah, okay. I see some thumbs up, so I'll just do that. You're not satiated yet. So the next one is called Reasons for Giving. Perhaps I'll read through the whole thing because it won't actually take long. Um, and next week we can, you know, get into it in a bit more detail. Yeah. So I'll read through this, and this is from the younger to the eight. So it's quite useful. Sometimes, you know, it will talk about eight reasons for giving. You can almost guarantee you'll find it in the younger to the eight. So that makes it easy. So here we go. These are in a way like sequential reasons. I'm not sure if it's completely in sequence, but the Buddha is basically talking about the sort of inferior attitudes behind giving and the more superior uh, ways to give. Yeah. So the best motivations for giving. There are monastics, or let's say community this time. Eight reasons for giving. What eight? Number one, one gives a gift from desire. Number two, one gives a gift from hatred. Number three, one gives a gift from delusion. So they're the wrong motivations, right? Number four, one gives a gift from fear. Number five, one gives a gift thinking, giving was practiced before by my father and forefathers, and maybe mother and foremothers too. I should not abandon this ancient family custom. Number six, one gives a gift thinking, Having given this gift, with the breakup of the body after death, I'll be reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. So that's number six already. So it's getting there, right? Number seven. One gives a gift thinking, when I'm giving this gift, my mind becomes placid and elation and joy arise. And then number eight, one gives a gift for the purpose of ornamenting the mind. And I really prefer the translation beautifying the mind, equipping the mind. So I added beautifying there. It's I think instead of ornamenting. There are these eight grounds for giving. So <laughs> there we go I think that's a good place to end because between now and next week you can have a think about that and perhaps put that into practice and check it out you know in yourself when you give like where is it coming from remembering that this is only a guideline you're probably never going to have a gift that fits exactly into one of those categories right there might be some gifts that are mostly for one thing there's a little bit of something else mixed in and that's okay, just notice it and notice how it feels. And maybe in your daily practice now, you know, in the next week or so, you could contemplate that and 
notice, you know, what kind of giving really does uplift the mind, what kind of giving goes even that bit further and becomes a, a way of beautifying or equipping the mind. And in the um, commentaries, I think, I forget which commentary, but some commentaries say that equipping the mind could mean like preparing the mind for meditation, preparing the mind for samadhi and insight practices. So what kind of giving is going to lead to that? And, you know, you don't have to judge yourself if you find, oh, I'm giving that gift from desire. I was giving it because I'm hoping to get something back, you know. <laughs> Never mind, you're still giving. It's still better than not, <laughs> hopefully. Um, yeah, so that would be interesting to explore, I think, over the next uh, week or so. And next week, all being well, I'm going to invite my very dear Bhikkhuni sister, Aya Chittananda, who's here, to, um, to take it from there. So she can fully read through that and give some comments. And, and uh, yeah, we'll share the session. We'll both chip in here and there. And uh, it'll be nice for you to hear someone else because I only have one mind. And even though my mind's quite, you know, uh, it's still the same mind. So I get bored with that. It'd be nice to have a different perspective for everyone here. Okay. So before you go, and I, I just want to say, actually, if Venerable Chittananda needs to go, because we're just going to do a tiny little Dhamma talk, uh, Dana talk and then um, say goodbye. But if you want to stay, please do, because we'll all say bye. It'll be kind of sweet. But you don't have to, because I know that it's your lunchtime. So either way, you can, you can stay or you can slip out. That's fine. So, all right, darling. Bye. Bye, darling. We call each other darling. Well, I do anyway. <laughs> You want to say bye? We can hear your lovely voice. Oh, thank you for the lovely session. I like the things that come out of your mind very much. <laughs> 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 I will look forward to hearing more next week, too. <laughs> um, and thank you to everyone for having me. And I look forward to seeing you all back again as well. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Great. So, who would like to speak next? Have you not discussed who's doing it? Now we have to yes. put you on the spot. No, not at all. Ah. Thank you very much for. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so um, talking about generosity, I would like to say a few words about the practice of dana, uh, which means generosity and uh, is an important practice on our path. Um, and it can help us let go of our self interest, cultivate our joyful mind, love and kindness and compassion. So um, if you would like to offer dana, your gift, whatever you are able to offer, will provide for Venerable Chanda's material needs and help her to continue spreading the Dharma, as well as support the development of the Bhikkhuni Monastery in the UK. Um, you can find more details about the project and on how to donate on the Anacampa website, and the link uh, is also in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kelly. And just to say that this Bhikkhuni Monastery in the UK doesn't yet exist. So this is really good opportunity <laughs> to be part of something, you know, not just financially, but just to be part of something spiritually, to be part of a new community. Um, and I think, you know, for now we have these Zoom platforms, but later on when we can start moving, we might actually want to have physical places that we can meet. So that will be such a place. So I do hope that you will stay on board with us and, you know, contribute in whatever way you can. Being part of our community, there will be all kinds of ways to support and be supported as well um, in the long run. So we're very much moving towards that goal. So thank you all for being here and being part of it. And I'm not going to forget today to thank the co-hosts all individually. So to Matthias for recording these sessions and to Kelly for doing the Dana talk today and Gunter for the Q&A. It's just great to have such a wonderful team. And there's many of other people here like Darian and Shirley and I'm sure many others who have been serving in one way or the other. So 
it's all very, very welcome and appreciated. So that is your wisdom and your understanding of the Dhamma manifesting in community. Great. So let's unmute you and we can wave goodbye. <laughs>